Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Baker, and I'm going over Romeo and Juliet Act 2, Scene 3, Friar Lawrence's Cell. This is the morning of day two of the play. We begin Scene 3 with Friar Lawrence's soliloquy on the nature of things, and he's talking about nature, weeds, flowers, the earth, but he's also talking about the nature of people, so we have a double meaning here. It's a pun. It's like a pun. Um, he talks to us a bit about uh, the time of day, so we know that it is sunrise. And then he talks about the cycle of life. You know, the earth, that's nature's mother, is her tomb. What is her brain grave that is her womb? So we have this double, um, whoops, double meaning there. And if you remember from West Side Story, Riff and Tony often said to each other, womb to tomb, birth to earth. Same thing, cycle of life. Okay. So we get also this discussion of the nature of things. And um, Friar Lawrence is an herbalist. You know, he likes gardening. He likes using his plants. Um, and if you're using your plants as medicine, you know that depending on the amount that you give, the medicine can then become a poison. So. If you notice, he says here, virtue itself turns vice being misapplied. Something good becomes bad being misapplied. So you take penicillin as um, an antibiotic. It's a medicine. It's a good thing. It's a virtue. But it becomes a vice, a negative, being misapplied. If I take too much penicillin, now it is poisonous and it's been misapplied and therefore it's no good anymore. But then he takes us a step further and says, and vice sometimes by action dignified. That something bad can become good or dignified depending on how you use it. So this is a lot like um, the end justifies the means. So I can do something bad that's technically bad if it's for the right reason. So I could steal. Stealing is wrong, but I could steal. It would be okay if I then fed my family, you know, stole bread to feed my family. So he's, it's really interesting that Friar Lawrence sees the world the way he does. He does not see it as black or white. He sees it as both. And everything is good or bad depending on how it's used. So he tells us that people are just like this too. People have the potential to be good or bad. Two such opposed kings and camp them still. You have the angel and the devil on your shoulder. And depending on what you do will determine if you're good or bad. You're not inherently always good and you're not inherently always bad. It depends on your actions. And he says though, but if the worser is predominant, if you do too much negative, Full soon the canker death will eat you up. You will be eaten from the inside out. That you will be consumed by all the negativity. It's interesting because as soon as he says these lines, of course, in comes Romeo. So, Romeo, we can tell, based on Friar Lawrence's words here, that Romeo does not like to get up early. And that it's only he's up early if he has a distempered head. So if there's something bothering him, then he'll be up early. And he talks a little bit more about that and then comes to the conclusion, oh no. It's not some distemperature that has roused him. In fact, he hasn't been to bed at all. And so Friar Lawrence then says, what? Have you been with Rosaline? Huh. Now this is rather interesting that Friar Lawrence says and asks, oh, have you been with Rosaline? Because what does this tell us about his relationship with Romeo? It tells us that they're very close, that Romeo confides in Friar Lawrence and tells him things. Uh, think back to Act 1, Scenes 1 and 2. Romeo's parents don't know about Rosaline. In fact, they ask Benvolio, could you talk to our son? Can you find out what's wrong with him? Why is he do so depressed? He won't tell us anything. Well, yeah, he's not telling his parents anything, but he's telling Friar Lawrence everything. And so now Friar Lawrence, we are revealed that Friar Lawrence and Romeo have a very close relationship. 
And then Romeo starts talking in riddles and says, Oh, I've been feasting with mine enemy, where one has wounded me. How are you wounded in love? Huh. Again, we're talking about love in terms of battle. Love hurts. This is, again, it's Shakespeare setting us up for the ending. And then we get on the next set all of these rhyming couplets. But if you notice, again, enemy, me. Again, in me, enemy and me rhymes, but remedies and lies does not rhyme. Huh. Do our lies, are they a remedy for the things that go wrong? Interesting. There is no rhyme there. These two do not rhyme, even though they look like they should rhyme. This is called... Dun, 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 dun. This is called a sight. Rhyme. So they look like they should rhyme, but they don't. And then if you go further with the language, there's tons of other rhyming couplets. Just put an arrow in there for us. This is a sight rhyme. Okay, we have low, foe, drift, shift, set, capulet, mind, combine, how, vow, pray, day, here, dear, lies, eyes, brine, rosaline. Waste, taste, clears, ears, sit, yet, oops, sit and yet don't, sorry, but they kind of do. Uh, th thine and Rosaline, then men, Rosaline, mine, but then key words, <clears throat> love, grave, and have. What do we know about the ending of this story? Love will have a grave. Hmm. Only in the grave can they have love. They can't be together. Interesting. And Friar Lawrence tells Romeo, like, he scolds him about loving, but it's because Romeo gets too obsessed with love, and it's, you know, he's too infatuated. So love shouldn't make one miserable, and that's pretty much what he realizes with Romeo. He doesn't really believe, like, you know, really? Do you really love Juliet? And Friar says, Thy love did read by rote, read by memory, and could not spell. You could read, but you were faking it. Um, so he, you know, Romeo convinces him, saying that, well, no, this is true love because Juliet loves me back. The other did not so. So Rosalind did not love him so. But regardless, Friar Lawrence decides to marry the two, not for love, but because they will bring an end to the feud. And we have another sight rhyme here. Love prove. What will love prove? I don't know. In the end, what will it prove for us? He's hopeful that the love will prove an ending to the feuding, but, but, but. The problem is this. He has a great solution right here to turn their household's rancor to pure love and to stop the feuding, but he doesn't tell anybody. He doesn't tell the parents. He doesn't go talk to the parents and say, I have a great idea. Nothing. And then we conclude the scene. Romeo's all excited. I'm going to go tell her, great. And he says, wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. Ron Lawrence is giving advice here. He's saying you got to move slowly because if you move too fast, you're going to fall down. Oh, really? Really, Friar Lawrence, because what do you think you're doing right now? Don't you think you're moving a little fast by, let's get married today. Okay. Of course we're going to stumble. A bit ridiculous. He gives this advice to the other characters, yet he doesn't follow his own advice. Friar Lawrence doesn't follow his own advice. Okay, so that's the end of scene three. Now, scene four, it's still morning time. And we now have Benvolio and Mercutio are talking. And Mercutio is a bit irritated that Romeo has not shown up at the house. Um, where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home tonight? Where are they? How come? Benvolio is like, nope, I haven't seen him. I spoke with his servant. Excuse me. And Mercutio calls and says, ha, he's with Rosaline, that same pale, hard-hearted wench, that Rosaline torments him so that he will surely run mad. But then we get a change of subject here, and Benvolio 
tells us that Tybalt has sent a letter to Romeo's house. This is very significant. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Tybalt is angry at Romeo. He's sent a letter challenging him to a duel because Lord Capulet had yelled him at yelled at him at the feast. But here's the thing, Romeo has no idea that Tybalt had gotten in trouble. He has no idea that Tybalt saw him at the party and now wants to fight him. And since he hasn't been home, he has no idea that this letter challenging him to a duel has been sent. And when Romeo shows up in the scene, his friends don't tell him either. Now, Mercutio makes fun of Tybalt here, and he and the thing is this, because Tybalt is a fashionable behavior, and he's quite a good fencer. Um, and, of course, Mercutio makes fun of everybody, so that's just the nature of him, okay? And when Romeo enters the scene, he's always the witty jokester teasing Romeo. And, again, Romeo, though, doesn't tell him the truth. He does not tell him he's been with Rosaline, and instead... Um, you know, they just continue joking around, and nor do the men tell him that the letter has been sent to his house. Now, we have five bolded ladies here that have are very significant allusions. These five bolded ladies, which you should recognize the name Helen from our study of the Odyssey. Uh, the others you may or may not from history class. All five of these bolded ladies had trouble with love. That their love for another person that they couldn't be with caused pain and suffering. Not that they died, they did not die themselves, but that they caused the death of others. Okay? Just note that. And we have a pun here. You gave us the counterfeit fairly last night. You gave us the slip. Um, you know, slip meaning you've slipped away, but also like a slip of paper, like a counterfeit paper. Okay? Um, so again, Mercutio is just lots of joking. All right, so they continue the joke, and but yet Mercutio recognizes that Romeo has changed, that he's no longer so cranky. And then the nurse enters the scene, and they keep on joking. They make fun of her. The nurse tries to act like a proper lady, but she's not. She's bawdy. She's um, she's a servant. So she does not act like a proper lady, and Mercutio knows she's not a proper lady, but she's pretending to be, so they make lots and lots of fun of her. Okay? And then the end of the scene here, Mercutio and the other guys leave. They've never mentioned the letter from Tybalt. Romeo's supposed to meet up with Mercutio later on, but yet, oh, will you come to your father's? We'll, dinner, we'll have dinner together. And Romeo says, I'll follow you. Oh, really? He'll follow me? When? Because what do we know he's doing this afternoon? So again, we have Romeo's going to ditch his friends another time. And now we get talking to the nurse and Romeo. The nurse is afraid that Romeo will be untrue to Juliet, lead her to a fool's paradise. He, she's afraid that he will play her. You know, he's not being um, honorable. We also have this reminder of the fight, because remember what will happen later on. We can expect some more fighting and dueling twice already. We've been reminded, both from Tybalt's letter and then now Peter's words here, that there should be fighting going on later on. Foreshadowing. All right. Now the scene concludes which, with the plans for marriage uh, that Romeo and Juliet will get married in secret in the friar's quarters. And then um, the nurse mentions a bit about Paris, but Romeo has no idea about Paris, huh? What's this? Interesting. Okay, now scene five is all about the nurse coming back and talking to Juliet and Juliet being impatient to get the information. Scene six is the wedding of Romeo and Juliet. But here's the interesting thing. Shakespeare never writes the actual wedding vows. Is this supposed to be the greatest love story of all the time? Well, then how come we are excluded from the greatest wedding of all time? These are some things to consider as you continue reading Romeo and Juliet.